it is a great honor to be here. Uh, I had a great couple of days uh, biking around uh, Prague, and I have to say that this is a city of incredible opportunity. And uh, it was great to get the invitation to come uh, and meet and address all of you, but importantly, to see what this city uh, is doing. And it has been a crossroads of Europe for so long. And sort of to see the architecture and, and the streetscape here is really astonishing. And I, I'm happy to report that I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for Copenhagen to really become uh, a world-class city, the world-class city that it's been for, for centuries, really. I mean, when you think about uh, Manhattan and you know what we did in Times Square, to pedestrianize Times Square. I mean, you pedestrianized old, old Times Square uh, here when we were still an old growth forest. So there's plenty of experience to share uh, back and forth uh, as we uh, talk about the issues that affect uh, cities going forward. So I think this uh, festival is, is spot on in talking about what we need to do to create a quality public spaces, uh, what we need to do to really make our cities the best they can be to have a quality urban life. And um, the fact that we are having this conference today, uh, I think is real evidence uh, that the push to make cities livable is really a global movement. And I think that's really uh, extraordinary and very inspiring. And the key for all of us is to do what we can to make our cities uh, sustainable, uh, because that is what it will take to make the planet sustainable. You all know the statistics about how 50% of the planet is urbanized today, expected to be 75% by 2050. So what we can do in Prague, what we can do in New York City, what we can do in, in the great cities around uh, the globe uh, will have everything to do with our future as a planet. Uh, and making cities work uh, is critical because they're so much more efficient than any other form, any other spread out form of, of development. Um, the average New Yorker uh, has one third the carbon footprint uh, of the average American. So as I like to say to US audiences, if you really want to save the planet, you should move to New York City. And people are moving to New York City. In fact, we are at a record high. Uh, there are 8.4 million people uh, that are living in New York City today. Um, but the only way that we can ensure New York continues to grow and thrive is to make it an even better place to live and investment and invest in. And the way we're doing that, there we go. Uh, in New York is by drawing from a broad spectrum of transportation planning, disciplines, and uh, technologies uh, to create uh, a series of choices and tools that really meet the broad goals of a more sustainable, uh, livable, and thriving city. Um, the effort for all of this, as was mentioned, uh, stems from Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC initiative, which he rolled out in uh, 2007. And the main premise of that plan was to use New York City's growth as a lever to modernize uh, our basic systems, transportation, environment, energy, housing, and basically uh, use that as the lever to improve our environment uh, overall. And I think importantly uh, for all of you, it really also challenged a series of long-held practices in city government. And it, it changed the way our government interacts. Um, in the past, our departments were fairly siloed. The Department of Transportation didn't necessarily talk to the Department of Environmental Protection or talk to the Department of City Planning or, uh, or talk to um, any other agencies, really. And so pulling together under this one umbrella was really a dramatic change in the way our, our government was organized. And importantly, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is a mayor that champions new ideas. He really is not satisfied with, well, we've always done it this way. Um, the idea that we need to try new things and we're not afraid to try new things and he will back you up if you try new things is one of the reasons that I think he's, he's the best uh, mayor uh, I've ever had the pleasure to work with and I think really the best mayor uh, on the planet. Um, the strategies that we've developed really have three major uh, dimensions. The first is uh, efficient mobility. Uh, the second main premise is treating our streets as the valuable spaces that they are. And the third is really focusing on safety and the safety for all users uh, of our streets. And I would say in regard to the second uh, dimension, uh, treating, uh, treating our streets as valuable spaces, 
uh, I was really incredibly inspired uh, and learned uh, from Jan Gell, who I think is here uh, with us today. And I have to say that spend as much time as you can with Jan Gell. Uh, because he is really not only uh, helping to transform uh, cities across the planet, but he does it in a very practical way, a very hands-on way, uh, and it's a very unusual talent. And we certainly benefited from that when we put together our Sustainable Streets uh, program. Uh, but these dimensions, I think, are a great prescription for any city, for any uh, transportation uh, planners. And I think that they could actually be adopted as an action plan for Resite. Um, in New York, they're also a key part of uh, New York City's mandate uh, to bring our, our city's basic systems into the 21st century. And so to realize all of these goals, we have made significant changes in the city's streetscapes over the past four years and I'm going to talk about our methods for getting that done. Prior to 2007, our streets really reflected a 1950s planning ethos uh, of making cities really adapt to ever greater volumes of cars. And we had really largely developed this singular engineering focus uh, on cars. Uh, and even though it didn't really help make our cars move better most of the time, uh, but what also happened and was sacrificed with that singular focus was other considerations like open space and greenery and uh, safety. Uh, and they were really sort of left behind by this uh, singular view. So in rethinking our streets today, we're really grappling with the fact that the relia this reliance on traffic engineering has left them really poorly designed uh, to meet the current needs that we have on them today. And when you think about it, you know, no business would still be in business if it continued to do the same things that it had done 50 years ago. And so, so too, it is, we need to update our streets. Uh, in fact, it's long past time for an update. And, you know, it's funny because New York is one of the world's premier walking cities, but it can be very dangerous, actually, uh, to walk around. And in many cases, New Yorkers trade the safety of the sidewalk for the street. Um, this was really brought home to me a couple of years ago when uh, these two people uh, went to Fifth Avenue, uh, which is a major corridor uh, in Midtown, and they had on DOT vests. And they started painting, they painted a line down the center of the sidewalk on Fifth Avenue. And on one side, they also painted visitors. And on the other side, they painted residents. <laughs> and uh, people followed it, you know, because New Yorkers like to move fast. Uh, this was an art installation, guerrilla theater. That we had nothing to do with it. Um, but it is a very good example of just the competition for the scarce street space uh, in New York City today. So our general view today is that our streets are extremely valuable, uh, and they have not been used to their full potential uh, or efficiency. And uh, this is not just a view of a few small people. This is actually city policy. Um, and it is, uh, it is reflected in a detailed action plan, uh, our strategic plan, uh, with 250 benchmarks so that the public can hold us accountable for what we plan uh, to deliver. And I'm happy to report that we have met 95% uh, uh, of the benchmarks in that plan, so we continue to update it uh, so that we continue to move forward here. Um, these are some of the primary goals. Um, I think in the past, it really would have been difficult to even identify what the city's transportation policy is. And I think we've set a pretty high bar in terms of the clarity of the vision, the ambition uh, of the plan, and um, uh, how easy it is to, to, to see what it is that we're doing. In practice, we have found that uh, many of these goals, safer streets, uh, streets that work better for all people, um, really, re and that reflect the social and the cultural and the economic vitality of New York City are, are mutually enforcing. And when we created these major uh, pedestrian spaces in along Broadway in 2009, um, and then again, you can see it here. Before I continue, how many of you have been to uh, New York City? Uh, okay, great. Well, we, all of the rest of you need to come. <laughs> So uh, this is some of what you'll see. Uh, this was in front of, uh, on 34th Street in front of Macy's. 
Uh, and and uh, we continued along this necklace. We created a green necklace along Broadway, completely reoriented Broadway so that it, it, it accommodated a bike lane and pedestrian lanes, better, uh, better movement of traffic. And we created a green necklace from 59th Street all the way down to uh, 14th Street. Uh, and you can see that here. Uh, and so when we did that, uh, and I think this is really important for cities that are looking to make these kinds of changes, we also unlocked a tremendous amount of economic value, uh, which really played to New York's strengths. And creating more pedestrian space is really good for business. Um, and more people who were not hassled by traffic, who, who uh, weren't crowded into small slivers of sidewalk, uh, uh, meant that they had more time to enjoy the city. And in Times Square alone, this is an area where we've got 356,000 people each day uh, in this, in this uh, small area. And when we closed it to traffic, uh, we found 11% more people, uh, uh, pedestrian volumes in the area. We found 84% more people that were taking advantage of the scenery and eating and taking pictures and, and lingering. Uh, we saw the opening of five new flagship stores uh, that you can see here, um, and retail rents doubled uh, in the area. Uh, and then importantly, uh, according to Cushman and Wakefield, it became one of the top ten retail locations on the planet. Uh, and that certainly wouldn't have been the case before when uh, this part of town was just inundated with traffic. It is actually popular, so popular now that developers have started calling uh, uh, the south part of, of 42nd Street, 42nd Street South, Times Square South, um, which, which is, is uh, really a surprise uh, and uh, a happy development. But as in other areas of our work, um, the goals uh, and action plan for our, for our streets is detailed uh, in this uh, world-class streets report uh, that we did uh, in conjunction with Jan Gell Associates, and we released this in 2008. Uh, and these new public spaces uh, are now in demand, uh, not only by citizens, but in, by, by business communities as well. And our, our partnership model uh, works with local businesses um, to create these business improvement districts uh, and other key stakeholders who take care of the space and they move the furniture in and out. Uh, we had some bad experiences in the 1980s when we created these uh, public spaces, but there was nobody there to maintain them. And you can imagine the inevitable. Uh, they became very dirty, garbage strewed, you know, a lot of drug use in them. And so under Mayor Bloomberg's watch, he's insisted that every time we create a new public space, we have a maintenance agreement in place uh, with local partners. Um, and there's a huge hunger uh, in the city uh, for new public space. You can see this here in uh, Madison Square. Uh, you can see this, this continues down. This is on 14th Street in Union Square. This is also where a big uh, uh, green market is. Uh, and the interest is not just confined to Manhattan or the Central Business District. Uh, the appetite for these kinds of changes is citywide. This is in East New York on New Lots Avenue where the number three line ends. And you know it, it doesn't look like it's that much and we moved very quickly, uh, but it made a big, big difference uh, in this part of town. Uh, so it was a really important addition to this neighborhood. And you can see this transformation all over. This is in Chelsea. Uh, on 14th Street, this is the before lanes of traffic turned into a uh, pedestrian plaza there. Uh, and you know, I do everything I can to document the benefits of these kinds of investments. And it was really brought home uh, to me the other day when uh, actually in this plaza it is right near the Apple Store, which opens on this plaza. And I guess somebody was running out of the store with an Apple computer and everybody yelled, thief, thief. And uh, some intrepid New Yorker picked up a chair, banged the uh, uh, robber, and took him out. And I immediately added it to my list of benefits of uh, the Plaza program. So you know you have to be creative in capturing uh, benefits here. Uh, this is our newest uh, plaza. This opened two weeks ago. You can see the before on top and the after afterwards. And it's impossible to find seats there. It is busy at all times. Uh, this is one of our earliest developments. This is in Dumbo in Brooklyn, and we did this over a weekend. Uh, essentially, we just used paint to paint the plazas and outline the curb, and then brought stones from an old bridge project, planters and tables and chairs, 
And I think it's really important because you do not have to wait years uh, for an expensive capital project to make these uh, kinds of projects happen. You can do it quickly uh, with temporary materials. Um, and in every single one of these instances where we've done these temporary, where we've done these quick plazas, they are always followed up with high quality, uh, attractive materials. But changing the use of a space is what's key. And that can be done in close to real time. And I'm not sure how you all feel about uh, change that happens in your city, but New Yorkers had been exhausted, waiting decades and generations to see change in their streets. So when we had the mayor's vision of a greater, greener New York, it wasn't just theoretical. One of the reasons it was so important and continues to be so important is because people can actually tangibly see what that means and see what a greater, greener uh, New York is all about. So this is, as you know, we did the temporary closure of Times Square, did a lot of data collection uh, about safety, about traffic, about economic development. And those findings supported Mayor Bloomberg's decision in 2009 to make that change uh, permanent. And so when we created this uh, great space, uh, uh, which was interesting uh, in and of itself, you can imagine the notion that we're going to close Broadway and we're going to make it better for traffic. Uh, but in fact, that was the case because uh, New York uh, in Manhattan is on a street grid uh, since 1911, and the only uh, street that's not part of that grid is, is Broadway. And it did great things, uh, created these plazas, but it also created these congestion hotspots. And so when we took Broadway out, when we closed Broadway really basically to cars, uh, it made the traffic network work much better. And so we saw uh, traffic moved better on 7th Avenue and on uh, 6th Avenue, sort of counterintuitive, uh, but it, uh, it certainly worked. And uh, Craig Dykers from Snohetta, uh, the design firm, I think will go through some more details about the final design for Times Square, but we could not be more pleased. It is a fantastic uh, design uh, with an incredible group of talented uh, architects from Snohetta. And uh, it's, it's going to be doing, we're going to be groundbreaking uh, within the next two weeks on this. And so you will see the first plaza uh, unveiling. If you're making your New York City travel plans, uh, the fall is when you'll be able to uh, see some of the new plaza, permanent plazas in Times Square, and also uh, ride one of the new bikes that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the plaza program, uh, we have 54 plazas that are in uh, development, uh, planning or implementation. We have two different programs. One is the quick plaza program I talked about. The other is an application-based plaza program where communities come to us and ask us uh, uh, to put plazas in their neighborhoods. And uh, it's been a tremendous uh, success. And new public space is really, really popular because uh, there really isn't enough space uh, in the city. Uh, it, new York is really almost a, a, a contradiction in that way. And uh, it's really a, a great place to walk around, but there's really no place to sit down. And so even when we put those orange barrels out, people materialize out of nowhere. It's like a Star Trek episode where they suddenly they come out of nowhere. And this was two hours after we put those orange cones out. This is a, uh, an art class from Parsons Design School. Um, our early surveys of the streetscape uh, found that basically New York City was essentially a city without seats. And that poses real problems for, uh, for uh, businesses, for seniors, uh, for parents with kids. And so we're trying to address this uh, not only with the new plazas, but with our new bench program. These are the new New York City benches. Uh, we are going to be putting 1,000 of them uh, around the city over the next uh, two years. We're also uh, changing curb lanes into public seating areas. These are the pop-up cafes. Uh, this is in Lower Manhattan and in Midtown. Um, again, it's an application-based program focused on the areas that really want uh, additional space. Uh, and we have really dramatically reduced the amount of negotiating time, the time to implementation, by having people apply to us because they really want uh, these interventions. We also don't think that our streets have to be used the same way at all times. And uh, five years ago, we started the weekend walks program. Uh, we have 24 neighborhoods that close their streets. And we set up these uh, pedestrian areas. And it's all community-based. They program them, bring the activities. It's been wildly popular. Uh, the demand continues to grow there. 
Um, probably our centerpiece uh, is called Summer Streets, where we close um, seven and a half miles of Park Avenue, uh, which is a major avenue in Manhattan. We close it to traffic uh, for three Saturdays uh, in August, and people walk and stroll and dance, and we have classes, and it is fantastic. We've had about 800,000 people uh, come out to Summer Streets uh, over the last uh, five years. Another key uh, focus area for us uh, is, the, is the art that we have in our streets. And I think attention to detail uh, is really, really important if we want to create a city that people want to linger in uh, rather than just hurry through. Um, and the plazas actually provide a great opportunity to showcase the work of artists. And uh, you have a huge artistic community here, and I think there's tremendous opportunities with that. Um, our projects have really also expanded the canvas uh, that you have to work with. We're doing our projects, this is a light project actually, uh, on the side of the Manhattan Bridge. Um, and we're also looking at any kind of blank uh, surface that's there. And we work with local community groups uh, on these designs and you can see them. Uh, these are uh, the, the barriers. This is actually on the, on the West Side Highway, on the West Side Greenway. Uh, but it really is, an important, is a great uh, touch and uh, really helps give a different visual experience uh, to people that are going through these areas. Um, our latest uh, big hit was a, a project that we did in December. It's called um, uh, Haiku, Curbside Haiku. And what we basically did is created these very attractive signs and then, which uh, also were coupled with poetry that had uh, safety messages in them, so, and a, and a QR code. Uh, and it was a great return. We had these big signs up, not big signs, eight and a half by eight and a half, and then the poetry was uh, underneath them. And some of them, we didn't have the poetry, we had a QR code, so in, in high school areas with kids, we're trying to get them involved uh, in, 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 in getting the safety message in a different way, so they all uh, participated, and it was a great, uh, return on investment. There was a great buzz on public safety. Uh, uh, the press reports even came out in haiku, uh, which was really uh, sort of fun to see. Um, so, and a big buzz on safety is actually really what we want to see. Because if we want to get more people out on bikes, out walking, uh, they have to feel safe doing so. And I think designing streets primarily for cars has had a very uh, detrimental impact on our cities. Uh, we've certainly seen that uh, in New York City, and it's taken us years to drive down uh, fatalities uh, in, in New York and really put pedestrians and cyclists back into the mix uh, safely. Uh, in New York, we see 4,000 people who are killed or seriously injured uh, on the streets of New York. 241 people uh, were killed uh, last year, and that is hardly the mark of a world-class city. We're the safest. Uh, city uh, in the U.S. Uh, really, more, our competitors are more uh, Tokyo or London, uh, but we really need to do a much better job in this regard. And so what we've done is we've created a very robust set of programs uh, to uh, accomplish that goal. Uh, our goal is to cut uh, traffic fatalities in half by 2030, and we're certainly uh, on, on our way to getting there. Uh, but this gives you a sense of what it really takes to retrofit a city. Um, and uh, to protect all users after years of looking at it differently. And uh, making it safe for everyone can be very simple. Uh, it can be just uh, creating a place for people to stand uh, and to give a signal that pedestrians are actually here. Uh, this, that was on Staten Island. This is actually a project that we did in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, again, we, what we do is we put these changes in on a rolling basis based on uh, the traffic fatality data that we have and the crash analysis uh, that we have. We focus uh, uh, around schools primarily uh, in the early part of the program. Now we're really focusing on areas with a lot of seniors uh, and kids. Uh, this is another example. This is up in Harlem. You can see the before and after. I wish they were all this easy, just the before, the after. Um, it doesn't always <laughs> go like that. Um, uh, you can also see the safety benefits in addition to the smashing people with the, with the chairs. Uh, there are significant uh, safety benefits for all users with these plaza programs, as you can see. We recently launched the first neighborhood slow zone, and I was happy as I was on a bike ride to see that you also have these slow zones and signs that tell you how fast uh, you're going. Uh, these are now done on a community request basis. Again, 
getting this application-based program in place is a really important way to get things done because you have the public asking you for these changes rather than being from the government and, um, and uh, putting them in. So um, we have about 100 neighborhoods that are now asking for these programs. Uh, speeding is a huge problem in New York City. It is a factor in one in four traffic fatalities. Uh, so we have a big campaign here. And uh, what we found in some pu public opinion polls was that actually New Yorkers did not know what the speed limit was. You know, some people even said, there's a speed limit? You know, I had one guy say, isn't it 55? You know, no, it's 30. It's 30 miles an hour. And it's 30 miles an hour for a reason. Because if you were hit by a car going 40 miles an hour, there's a 70% chance you'll die. If you're hit by a car going 30 miles an hour, there's an 80% chance you'll live. That's why it's 30. Um, so we have uh, underscored this with some pretty dramatic speed boards uh, that we have all over town. It's also coupled with some campaigns that we have on drunk driving. There's a campaign called You the Man. Um, if you've got an iPhone, download You the Man. It's free. Um, we've got, uh, uh, you can find out where the nearest uh, car services, transit services, what your blood alcohol content is. There's a spin the bottle thing on there to pick the designated driver. Um, it's a big hit. And um, we've done the same thing for cycling. Uh, New Yorkers uh, are not subtle. And so our safety campaign to get uh, cyclists to follow the rules of the road is called don't be a jerk. Um, because it, you have to be sometimes fairly straightforward with New Yorkers. And with all of our safety messages, what we've tried to do is to get beyond the don't drink or don't speed or don't do this or don't do this to make them attractive and amusing. Because we found that people, you know, people don't want to hear what to do from government, from their spouses, from anyone. They, they really don't like to be told what to do. And so if you can capture them with a little humor, uh, you can actually get that message in. And so we're really focused uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. Um, we're also working a lot with schools uh, and with school administrators, uh, teaching them the, the, the science of safety and in integrating it into physics programs, into math programs. And uh, this education has also gone a long way to uh, creating the demand among communities uh, for safer streets. Uh, safer streets and, and, and safe, safety and sustainability uh, really uh, are not always talked about hand in hand, but they should be. Uh, as I mentioned, if we want more people to walk and take the ferry and take the bus and the streetcar, they have to feel safe doing it. And so what we've done is uh, we did a comprehensive study, a five-year study of all of the crashes, all of the accidents and injuries in New York City, and it has become our Rosetta Stone for where we make our investments. It really is the who, what, where, when, and why uh, of our investment program. Uh, and so it has been a, an important guide for us uh, moving forward. Um, I think, you know, when you think about it, uh, cycling in the city uh, is also a really important part of our safety strategy. When we put a bike lane down in New York City, that street becomes 40% safer uh, for all users, for cyclists, for pedestrians, for motorists. And I'm really captured uh, by the potential of cycling globally, uh, in particular New York City because we've got the great raw ingredients uh, we're essentially flat, and most of the trips in New York City are under two miles. So um, added to the fact that over the last 20 years, in the rehabilitation of our bridges, we have 879 bridges, uh, all of the major bridges now accommodate uh, a bikeway. Uh, and so, but the key to all of this is, is safety. And I don't think it's an accident that the spiking, uh, the increased uh, rate in cycling that we've seen doubling over the last four years, uh, started when we came up with this interconnected uh, bike network, uh, adding 270 miles of on-street uh, bike lanes. And this is where it was in 2005, uh, and this is where it is today. This is another one of those slides where you wanna, it's just so easy, you just draw lines on the map. Uh, and so, uh, an important part of the expansion has been design innovation. And uh, I think what it's going to take to get more people on bikes is that they feel safe doing so and that they are protected uh, from traffic. And I have to give a big shout out to Copenhagen because uh, that was where I saw uh, the, the design for using parked cars as a barrier, safety barrier to protect uh, cyclists, and it does not cost hardly any money at all to do, and it's very quick to implement. 
Uh, and that's why in these kinds of lanes we've seen uh, cycling uh, uh, go from an increase of 50% to 200%. Uh, and this is what you're seeing uh, all over the city. Uh, this is Columbus Avenue on the, on the upper uh, east side, upper west side. And this is an important piece because our, every single one of our bike lanes is anchored by pedestrian islands. And that's a big part of making this city safer. Um, and particularly for kids uh, and seniors because you're shortening the distance to cross the street and you're making pedestrians visible in a way that they're not when they're sort of, you know, inched over on, the, on, a, on a crowded sidewalk. These lanes are also great recreational facilities. This is uh, in Prospect Park West. Uh, and uh, you can see how uh, the beautiful design there. Uh, this design, I might add, uh, was the subject of a lot of press scrutiny, uh, a lawsuit. I was sued over this. Uh, and you can see what a dangerous looking thing it is. Uh, and, uh, but it is funny because since we've started doing, since the opinion polls have, have come out, which show a two to one support uh, for bike lanes, uh, New Yorkers support bike lanes by a two to one margin, you've seen a lot of that rhetoric uh, go down. And people are really voting with their pedals and they really like uh, the changes, uh, particularly on the safety, safety front. Um, we're also up in the game on bike infrastructure. We've got new um, bike shelters. We have uh, 10,000 new racks coming in. Um, we've changed uh, legislation so that bicycles can now uh, come in to commercial buildings uh, using the freight elevators, uh, which was really key because we found that one of the reasons that New Yorkers were not biking to work was because they didn't want to leave their ride on the streets of New York. We've made great progress reducing crime in the city, uh, but still people did not want to leave their bikes uh, on the streets. So uh, this has gone a long way uh, to getting more people biking to work. Uh, I also might add uh, the Department of City Planning, I think uh, Alex Washburn is here, uh, under Amanda Burden's leadership, uh, the zoning code has changed so that for new construction uh, and for major renovations, uh, bike access has to be built into new buildings, which is also a really important piece uh, going forward. Uh, the new designs uh, uh, are, uh, have been taken up all over the city. And, uh, not only all over the city, but all over the country. And this is actually uh, 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 an example of the innovation at the city level uh, coming together to drive federal policy. We put together this urban bikeway design book, uh, which is a new guide that all cities can use in the redesign of their streets. And our aim is to have this adopted by all states uh, and the federal government has endorsed it, the Secretary of Transportation has endorsed it. But a lot of times outdated codes can hold you up from the innovative designs that you want to see done and you have to go through committee and committee and committee to get things done. And that was true in the United States also. Um, but our streets shouldn't be adapted to fit Iowa uh, or Nebraska. You know, New York City streets need to work in New York City environments and metropolitan areas are the economic generators of the country. That's where 75% of our GDP uh, comes from. So we have to have uh, rules of the road that actually work for cities. And so uh, this has been a very important uh, program to make this happen, not only in New York City, but cities uh, across the United States. So back in New York, our next major step is the launch of our public bike share uh, system. Uh, it will have 10,000 bikes and 600 stations. Uh, we're very excited about it. I feel like a proud mama after four years of being pregnant with this. Uh, I think it looks beautiful, don't you? It's a really beautiful looking bike. Um, but what we did with this program is we really combined uh, the best of, of uh, best practices we saw around the world. We used London's uh, example of using a sponsor. They, they're sponsored by, by uh, Barclays. Ours is uh, City Bike, Citibank. And, uh, which is a nice city bank, city bike. I really like that it gets confused like that. Um, and then also taking advantage of the experience of US cities that, that used a solar power and wireless system. So you can actually move these stations around if you need to. Uh, they're not dug into the street, which makes it much less expensive to implement and much easier, uh, particularly on communities or where you find that you've got a different need or you need to uh, literally recite them. Um, and the, the system is really uh, about a, a new continuum of choices, transportation options, that New Yorkers have to get around town. 
um, it really, I think, will do a tremendous amount to extend our transit system. And in many, on many lines, our transit system is functioning uh, at capacity, and there's really no more room for growth. So this not only will uh, extend the transit system, but also open up other areas that are currently too far away uh, from a transit system uh, and really don't have a lot of uh, coverage there. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of excitement. We, tr we crowdsourced the siting of the stations, and we had 10,000 people uh, suggest station sites, 10,000 people for 600 sites, which I think speaks to the um, support for this. Uh, and then also recently uh, a, an opinion poll was taken and it found that 72% uh, of New Yorkers uh, support the bike share program, which is, I think, great news. The systems work by being readily available and so we're following the same density every couple of blocks uh, that you'll see in Paris and London if you've been there. Um, the stations themselves are designed to fit into the New York City uh, street furniture uh, family, and uh, I also think they're quite beautiful. You will see on the side there's also a pedestrian wayfinding uh, system on the side of the kiosk there, uh, and uh, so we think we're really creating an incredibly, an incredible new generation of cycling and pedestrian infrastructure uh, for New York City. Uh, we're also working to improve mobility, the mobility of our buses. Uh, which really are quite slow. We have the largest bus fleet in North America and we have uh, the slowest uh, bus speeds. And buses are used by three million New Yorkers every day and they just sort of creep along. They have actually awards, uh, some of the advocacy groups give out awards, they give out the Pokey Awards uh, to the slowest lines. And every year there's a competition uh, 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 between a, a person on a tricycle and a bus to see who can go the fastest and guess who wins every year. So um, we're really designing the street uh, and the service itself and uh, really creating a new model. You can see this is where some of the systems that we have in place right now are in the Bronx, uh, which was our first line. Uh, it is a tremendous uh, hit. We have off-board fare collection, so you pay before you get on the bus. We have transit signal priority so that the buses are, uh, the traffic signals see the bus coming, hold the green light for the bus to get it through. Um, it is a, a tremendous success from that uh, uh, angle. Uh, First and Second Avenue, which we're doing, uh, we did last year and we're building out the bus bulbs right now. You can see ridership up, travel time down. All, all of these examples, by the way, uh, show projects uh, that are with increased ridership and this is amid a citywide decline in bus ridership. So these small interventions, dedicated lanes, you know, uh, three-door boarding, off-board fare collection, make a big difference. Uh, and this is our plan going forward. Uh, you can see there's a plan uh, all over uh, the city of New York and again, low cost to implement and certainly faster to implement, particularly when you take a look at the capital cost uh, of a subway system. Uh, and you can see, in addition, that real estate brokers, the real estate community is starting to understand the benefits of this. They get the value added to real estate when there's an improved uh, transit connection there. Uh, we're also using technology to enforce the lanes, and so we have cameras that take pictures of cars that are in these dedicated bus lanes. And uh, on this, on 34th Street, uh, or on, on First Avenue, uh, we have 7,000 tickets that are given out a month, uh, which is a lot of tickets. Um, but we're starting to see the tickets go down as people start to really uh, respect uh, the lane. And we've uh, delivered this corridor, this is a 16-mile corridor, uh, in under two years and at a cost of $10 million. So you can get a lot done with, with not a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, it's, I think it's, again, important to underscore that all of these projects, we're looking to create safer streets, more livable places, greening up the street, um, they all go together. And uh, uh, you can create better, better spaces. This is a great uh, example in Grand Army Plaza uh, where it was kind of a mess. And this was actually a good before picture. I don't know why I don't have a bad, worse before picture. But, you can make a huge difference there. That was one of the worst uh, areas in the city for traffic accidents. 
Um, and all of these projects that I'm talking about are not one-off projects. They're not just something that happens and the next mayor that comes in or the next transportation commissioner that comes in, you know, they all go away. They are actually embodied and codified in our street design manual. So all these designs are in there and they have to be used by public entities or private sector entities uh, that touch the street. And I, I think that it is uh, a really important uh, legacy uh, for future New Yorkers and future uh, mayoral administrations uh, to design uh, great streets. Uh, this is a design that we have for Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn. Uh, what the median there is going to be, uh, it's green infrastructure. We're doing uh, a lot right now uh, to capture storm water naturally. Uh, when you come to New York, this is what you will see on First and Second Avenue. We're now also using green infrastructure on our bus bulbs. And um, I'll conclude by uh, our, our latest project, which is this pedestrian wayfinding uh, system that we're creating right now. Um, we've got a great system of signage for cars, you know, 34th Street, North, South, all of that. But, you know, we don't have a great system of signage for pedestrians. Anybody on foot, it's impossible to get around. And in fact, New Yorkers, we did a survey and we found that at any given time, New Yorkers are lost 10% of the time. And that's just the New Yorkers that will admit it, you know? So it's probably much higher than that. You've probably been to New York where somebody will say, oh yeah, it's right over there. Yeah, just go over there, you'll be fine. They have no idea where uh, you wanna go. Um, so we think that if we can create a regular uh, system of dependable maps, people will know that they will find a map every couple of blocks. Uh, they will get beyond their sort of normal routines, uh, their mental maps of the city, uh, and we think it's going to be an important way uh, to add uh, an important new infrastructure, uh, encouraging people uh, to walk around the city. Uh, we haven't quite finalized the design. I wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of options uh, that we're taking uh, a look at. And, uh, you know, in closing, I would just note that, you know, we've made all of these changes in four years, uh, but as you know, nothing is easy. Uh, and we have 8.4 million New Yorkers, and I have learned that we have 8.4 million traffic engineers. Uh, because everybody has a very specific view of how their streets should be used uh, and designed. Um, and what we've done uh, to get this change through is to develop an extremely transparent and open and robust public engagement process. We hold over 2,000 uh, meetings every year. Uh, every single night my staff is out doing uh, public meetings. All five boroughs uh, have borough offices that are focused on stakeholder outreach. Uh, and so it is an extraordinary uh, program and you cannot do enough uh, when it comes to talking to communities and then they are part of the process. They help design what's out there and you really uh, can get a lot more done when you are working collaboratively uh, with communities. We also do a lot uh, online. Um, we've got, uh, you, if you can't make it to a community board meeting, you can uh, input your uh, uh, comments uh, through any of our portals. We also have Tumblr sites. Uh, we have a daily pothole blog. Uh, the mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, is uh, absolutely a data-driven mayor and he wants us to be accountable, and so you can file pothole complaints, take pictures of potholes, send them to me, you know, so we have this incredible uh, database uh, uh, for, for the city. But a lot of the work is still face-to-face, -face and we do a lot. Uh, this is uh, asking people what they thought about uh, different wayfinding options. Um, uh, on the bike share system alone, we had like 300 public meetings. Uh, it was extraordinary. Um, but the baseline for everything that we do is data, and we work very, very hard on the before and after, measuring what gets measured gets done, and we have a deep accountability. We're measuring not only micro trends, but macro trends, and we have reports on our major projects uh, that we release uh, every year, and I think it's been an important reason why we've been able to get as much done uh, as we have. And finally, this is uh, 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 the new Willis Avenue Bridge, $600 million bridge floating in on the East River. 
uh, new, newest piece of jewelry to our infrastructure. And I put it in here because we would not be able to implement these new programs if we were not taking care of the basics. Uh, and our road and our bridge infrastructure is in the best condition it's been in generations, thanks to $4.3 billion uh, that the mayor has dedicated to uh, those infrastructure programs over the last four years. And our infrastructure is the envy of the nation. Uh, every single one of our facilities is in a state of good repair. Um, so again, you can make these big changes, you can make them quickly, you can get a lot done. Uh, I think we've shown uh, what can be done in four years to transform a city. And you can follow us. All of the materials that I've talked about are available online. Uh, and I encourage you to, to follow us. And uh, it's, it's been a, a terrific, I think, uh, program uh, to show what is really possible to create a, a sustainable city in the 21st century. Thank you.